I think one of the differences about these chapters is that they were to a large extent, of course, responding to an emerging large literature on adaptation. But I think they're also really framing chapters, trying to make sense of what we mean by uh, an adaptation goal, or in our case, particularly an adaptation limit. What might that be? And I think that's the way in which we interpreted our charge in the end, was to see what literature there was available and, uh, and then really to try to develop a framework for trying to put that together, to put together a, a more coherent and in, particularly, in particular a, a risk-based approach to understanding uh, limits to adaptation. Because I think we were all very influenced by the risk framing uh, that we were, were given at the beginning. And that, I think, allowed us to make some progress in the work we did uh, on this particular subject. So I won't say a lot about opportunities <coughs> and constraints to adaptation today, other than to say that, uh, of course, there are many opportunities to adapt. And by that, we mean uh, means by which new technology, uh, early warning, information, policy, incentives, and so on, that enable people to respond creatively and positively to climate change. That you know, leaves, of course, the, the, also the obvious question that some world regions and in some sectors under conditions of climate change, agriculture and temperate regions clearly uh, have, have benefits. Uh, uh, we um, also, of course, um, were able to plot a large literature on constraints to adaptation, economic constraints, uh, cultural and institutional constraints, uh, uh, technical constraints, and so on. And we were able to, I think, give a good overview of the large literature that exists around those constraints. But as I say, most of our, our work is really about limits. So that's what the focus of this talk will really about, be about. What are adaptation limits? And how did we come to develop a risk-based framing of what those <coughs> limits might be? So these are the people we worked with in, in Chapter 6. So uh, I just showed their pictures and to acknowledge that uh, uh, what I'm going to say today is really the output of, of this group, who were the, who were the main uh, authors, uh, and of course also with uh, intensive in, uh, interactions with uh, the rest of, uh, of Working Group 2. The question of limits to adaptation is really a vital one, and it's one actually, unfortunately, that was, has been you know, underdeveloped, I think, in, 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 in the literature. Many economic models of climate change impacts make an implicit assumption that perhaps there are not limits to adaptation, that in fact, even under a 10 degree world, it will be possible to find ways of um, uh, achieving food security, for instance, for <coughs> 9 billion people. And that is because ingenuity and economic growth and so on will uh, provide the means to achieve that. If there are no limits to adaptation also, there's really the question about why you one would mitigate. So I believe it's very vital to come to a, a def definition a good and robust and scientifically credible definition of our limits to adapt as a really foundational argument for mitigation as well. And that is a kind of realization that we came to in doing the work uh, in this chapter. Maybe it's been obvious to other people for a long time, but in our little group of authors, uh, that perhaps was not obvious right at the beginning of the process four or five years ago. We also believe that it's important to focus on <coughs> limits, so really develop a robust analysis of where these limits might be in order to be able to focus adaptation resources on the most vulnerable, to be able to identify hotspots sectorally or regionally or socially where there is likely to be transformative adaptation because part of our definition of what a limit is is really a point at which there are discontinuities in behavior. And of course, as I say, uh, a, a definition of limits really should also underpin mitigation goals. Uh, 
uh, in the end because we really care uh, uh, about achieving uh, 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 concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere or carbon budgets that will remove to a large extent the risk of achieving of reaching adaptation limits for most populations in, in the world and for ecosystems as well, of course. So the basic idea that we came to in the end was that um, mitigation would, of course, achieve a great deal of risk reduction if mitigation is successful at a global level. And beyond that, of course, we will absorb a certain amount of risk that we have to things we value, whether that's food security or uh, our livelihoods or uh, a place where we live, through adaptation. Uh, but there is li likely to be always a residual loss, and, and that is, of course, linked to the current debate in the, uh, in the treaty on loss and damage. And that is, this is also something which is implicit in economic modelling of adaptation, that you never adapt to remove all uh, losses because that is not efficient or optimal. Um, there will always be some residual loss. And the question of the limit is really the level at which those losses become intolerable in some sense. And so the definition of intolerability becomes rather fundamental to the definition of where such a limit might lie. So now I'm quickly going to scoot through uh, how we work this idea uh, further uh, and then develop some research questions which I believe emerge out of this work on limits to adaptation. So of course uh, we see lots of impacts and I think when we see impacts, Tacloban or Venice, uh, uh, Inuits were mentioned, uh, we're often, I think, faced with the question, is that a limit to adaptation or does, lim uh, or does adaptation continue under these extreme circumstances? Venice, of course, has been fun f flooded every year uh, uh, for hundreds of years uh, and people have coped with it, so that is clearly not a limit. Uh, and now they're building a, r a large barrier in order to prevent those losses or the disamenity associated with it. But somewhere in there, there probably is a limit that we need to be able to define. The, def the definition of a limit is clearly also linked to the larger debate about thresholds in global systems, tipping points, and so on. And if we could find a way of linking a debate about limits to adaptation to tipping points, which are often biophysically defined, I think that would be very useful too. Uh, tipping points somehow imply also potential limits in the capacity to adapt of coastal cities, of agricultural systems, of uh, forest systems and so on. We see in, uh, and this is a diagram which has already been shown, uh, that uh, changes in crop yields historically and certainly going forward, there are potential limits in the capacity to ensure food security globally, but certainly in particular regions as well. What, are, what is a food security limit and how would you define it? Where would you find it? Could you see it creeping up on you? Would there be early warning of so, such a limit? And then, of course, this is another diagram from uh, Working Group 2. There might well be limits, and that is implied in this diagram as well, in the capacity of ecosystems to uh, adapt, to respond to uh, different uh, 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 quotient, quotients, different speeds of, of, of climate change. So the way in which, in the end, we came to a risk framing of adaptation limits was very much to focus on the tolerability. In this case, most of the work we did was on uh, social actors, so uh, people, rather than ecosystems. We believe this basic framework could be applied to ecosystems as well focus on the tolerability of climate-related risks to certain social objectives which are valued by people. As I say, uh, the ability to have a certain level of flood protection, uh, the, the ability to reliably grow a crop and, and thereby achieve a, a livelihood as a farmer, uh, uh, the ability to live in a certain place, an Inuit uh, uh, village uh, in, the northern, uh, in, the, in the northern coast of, of, of the Arctic Ocean, for instance and very much focus on risks as they were experienced by actors, 
embedded, of course, in social systems or uh, ecosystems, but very much focused on the limits of particular actors. And so the definition we came up, up with was that a limit was the point at which an actor uh, was unable to secure valued objectives, and valued objectives, I've, I've defined what they might be, and they could be all sorts of different things, from intolerable risks as a result partly of climate change, despite having adapted. So it's the end of adaptation, as it were. So here's a very simple example. It's a related, it's a, it's a case uh, uh, related to rice in <coughs> Thailand. Uh, it's to do with the pollination temperature at which, uh, well, the temperature at which pollination for rice uh, declines after about 26 degrees and really stops between 32 and 35 degrees. These kinds of conditions at night were experienced in, the, in one of the 2011 rice growing seasons in Bangkok. The reason this is important is because Thailand at the time was the largest exporter of rice in the world and therefore a very major uh, uh, co contributor to global food security. Uh, the objective here was to produce rice. The in intolerable risk that we talk about is the loss of farmer livelihoods in the future or, or in that season by their in in inability to, to grow rice. And the hard limit here is that although geneticists have been working very hard over several decades to breed rice varieties that can pollinate beyond 32 degrees, that so far has not yet been successful. And so uh, there, there's, a, there's a tabulation, there's a graph that we developed that tries to explain where this adaptation limit might be uh, and, and, and tries to quantify and, and provide a really, uh, you know, sort of, you know a good conceptual framework for trying to identify where these limits might, lead, uh, might, might exist for different social uh, groups in different regions for different kinds of valued objectives. So very quickly, what kinds of research challenges emerge from this kind of risk framing of adaptation limits, as I've argued limits being a very important new field that we ought to get to grips with and connect to the wider climate debate? The first is the question of what is a valued objective and the degree to which people are willing to give up certain kinds of things in the face of climate risk. And a very simple way of uh, 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 putting that question is would you trade wheat for rice in your diet? I mean, under conditions where it becomes difficult uh, uh, reliably to produce rice, would people substitute cassava or wheat Maybe they're doing that already because they are starting to eat more beef burgers and, uh, and bread as part of modernization processes. But there is a really deep question there about what are the valued objectives which are non-negotiable in cultures, in societies, and which uh, have a risk of being crossed as a result of uh, rising climate risks. A second question and research issue is really around risk tolerance. What kind of uh, level of risk are we willing to tolerate? Of course, in many of what, uh, many uh, sectors, we tend to want to reduce the amount of risk, certainly in capital markets, in agricultural systems, in health systems, in, in flood protection and so on. We want to be able to provide greater security. But it might well be that under cert in certain sectors, under conditions of climate <laughs> change, one is going to reverse that secular trend towards greater security. And then the question is, what level of risk tolerance is there uh, in particular populations, in particular regions, in, in particular sectors? A, a third area, which I think is very important and also um, uh, Sherry uh, related, uh, 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 talked about or referred to, is this really important issue of systemic risk. Risk limits, of course, are not particular to actors in a particular place, but our capacity to overcome limits is obviously related to uh, uh, multi-level uh, resource flows and, and, and so on that exist at the global level. But we might very well see, under conditions of climate change, the collapse of two important grain growing areas in a particular season because of drought. This is a probability you can calculate now, I think. What happens when you have these emerging interconnected cascading risks through global systems and limits in terms of global food security that might be achieved there. And these are really vital and important research issues which we cannot now yet deal with, but we will have to deal with now. In fact, 
you know, there are studies emerging that are doing these uh, uh, collapse of two breadbasket kind of studies. And fourthly, I think a really important area is how we govern at the limits. As we uh, uh, reach these kinds of limits, and hopefully we can see them coming, what is happening to the people? How are we compensating? How are we dealing with the losses that people are facing as a result of the discontinu uh, discontinuities in behavior that they need to show as they shift away and they try to avoid uh, the limits? Um, so uh, how do we manage those emerging uh, uh, climate and adaptation emergencies uh, as, as, they, as they come upon us in the time uh, of the future? So that's all I wanted to say, uh, uh, Neil. Thank you very much.